My name is Joe Cable. I'm a uh, professor of psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. I am interested in how people make decisions and in individual dif differences in how people make decisions, particularly in uh, the domain of impulsivity and decisions that involve an inherent trade-off between your current interests and your future interests. Um, uh, so decisions that involve some aspect of self-control because you have to give something up now in order to have more later. One of the unique aspects of my research program is that we are trying to integrate both a psychological level of analysis and a biological level of analysis. So we're interested in understanding individual differences both at sort of a level of, you know, personality description, a psychological level of description, as well as a um, neurobiological level of description. And so, you know, to give you an example of that kind of a approach, one of the um, recent set of investigations that we've done has really been about identifying brain markers, brain phenotypes, aspects of the structure and function of your brain that are associated with and predict whether you're someone who's going to be more uh, future-oriented, um, who is going to have a degree of time preference that, that sort of values the future more, or whether you're someone who's going to be more impulsive and sort of present-oriented and discount delayed rewards to a greater extent. One of the interesting things that we're finding is that there are aspects of your brain function in terms of the structure, the amount of um, gray matter, for example, in different areas of the brain that uh, predict the extent to which you're um, going, you know, more or less impulsive. Um, that there are aspects of your resting brain function where we can put you in a brain scanner and just sort of, uh, without asking you to do anything, sort of index uh, the degree to which certain brain regions are interacting with each other um, in a coordinated way at rest. And that is predictive of the degree to which you're more or less impulsive. And this kind of effort is, uh, I think it's useful in a couple of ways. One is, is, a, is a basic science way of understanding what generates um, impulsivity and what generates sort of a foreshortened <laughs> um, future time perspective that by knowing what aspects of brain function um, are different in individuals who are more impulsive or have a, 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 a foreshortened time perspective or are different in people who have a longer time perspective. That by understanding that, that tells us something, uh, given, given our understanding of the function of those regions, that gives us some hints about the psychology <laughs> um, that drives people to be more or less um, uh, um, impulsive. So I think there's a basic science piece, sort of a, um, uh, better understanding piece it sort of feeds back to the personality level and there is also uh, a, a, you know a very early stage as more practical piece in terms of identifying people who you might want to pay more attention to so in a recent study you know we've identified these markers in an adolescent population it's a time period in which you know risky or impulsive behavior during that time period could have many long-term consequences. And so being, being able to say these are additional markers that would tell you kind of who, um, uh, who's more at risk for that, I think could, could prove uh, uh, of practical use. We have you know, some data from young adults to suggest that structures in a network of brain regions called the default mode network um, are uh, different in individuals who have a shorter versus longer time perspective. Um, and uh, uh, one of the pieces of this default net network is the, um, uh, an area, the, a, st a set of structures in the brain called the medial temporal lobe, which is uh, very important for episodic memory. So remembering, you know, 
what you had for breakfast, remembering what it was like on the day that you, you know, uh, graduated from high school, uh, uh, remembering, you know, uh, meeting your significant other. But that is also important for generating or imagining potential future outcomes. And so we think that its role in generating those future outcomes uh, may be the reason why it's important in determining who's more or less um, uh, impulsive, who has a lord, shorter or longer time, you know, time horizon when thinking about the future. One of the things that we've done recently is uh, look at an association between your ability to vividly bring to mind future outcomes and uh, the degree to which you discount uh, delayed rewards. And so the fact that these two might be associated, we got some cute clues about that <laughs> um, from, the, from the brain data. Um, the degree of the association when we brought it back to the psychological level was, was surprising to us in this recent study in that what we found was that individuals who are better able to bring to mind uh, vivid scenes that are not the here and now um, uh, were actually more impatient and more impulsive and more present biased, more present focused. Um, that we had expected that maybe it would be the opposite, <laughs> but when we went out and measured it, it, it actually went in, in this direction. And I think what that has suggests to us is that I think people who have that personality type can both vividly imagine things in the future, but they also can vividly imagine things in the present. <laughs> and so by, you know, sort of raising both of these up, the net influence is actually um, to drive you towards the, the, the present outcomes. This has a, a corollary in some uh, famous psychological work that has suggested that construing things in a more abstract way actually leads you to be more future oriented. Um, uh, and that sort of fits with sort of having a personality where you think about everything very vividly <laughs> as being more present oriented. There's the, the very famous set of experiments from uh, uh, Walter Michel um, where one of the counterintuitive aspects of those original experiments was you would think uh, if I put both the one marshmallow that you could get right now, um, it, it, so it makes intuitive sense that if I put the one marshmallow that you can get right now in front of you, um, that you're more likely to take the marshmallow now. Um, what's not quite intuitive is that if I also put the two marshmallows that you could get if you wait in front of you, that also pushes you to be more impulsive, right? That somehow making turning this from a more abstract question of do I want one marshmallow versus two marshmallows into a more concrete question of wow, do I want that or do I want that you know, thing that I can smell and taste in front of me um, actually pushes you to be um, uh, uh, more um, present focused and present biased. And one of the questions that I am uh, have become interested in is the extent to which a certain analogy might be true, which is um, we understand kind of social networks and we can and we have techniques for mapping those social networks and techniques for sort of describing the links that you have with other people and how those links might have an influence on your own behavior and how information might flow through those links and how even you know behaviors might flow um, you know uh, through those links. Um, one of the things that I've become interested in is the extent to which we could think about uh, brain structure in the same way um, and whether it will also lead to a revolution in how we think about brain function by thinking about the links between uh, different brain regions and the information that flows between different brain regions given those links and whether a sort of way of um, thinking about the complexity of, of neural function through the lens of networks will, will be a useful way forward. I think it has a potential to do something interesting which is provide a uh, principled way to link 
structure with function, right? So to say, okay, um, you know, I think there's a lot of interest about, you know, the human connectome and tracing out the structural links between different areas of the brain and how those, you know, I'm interested in how those differ across individuals. Um, but I think to be able to translate that to the level that I care about, which is a level of function, which is a level of, you know, what that means for the behaving person, <laughs> right? You have to have a theory that says, well, given these structural connections, that's going to be particularly, um, uh, that's going to be a better setup for this kind of information transformation, which is going to lead to this kind of behavior. Um, and I think that um, uh, network theory provides one potential link between those different levels uh, of analysis. So we've, you know, started some studies in this domain and some collaborations in this domain with, um, you know, physicists and engineers and computer scientists across campus. Um, uh, and, you know, it's interesting because it's the same, you know, physicists and engineers and computer scientists across campus who are also thinking about, you know, the transformation of information across the social network.